And without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Patrick. Um, Patrick is a compagnon passant champentier du devoir and uh, founder of the Professional School of Practical Stereotomy, a small private professional school unique in the English speaking world where students are given the experience in the UNESCO classified knowledge of practical stereo stereotomy. I bet you didn't know that there was such a thing as practical stereotomy. I wonder what impractical stereotomy is. He specializes in historical and traditional carpentry practices and has worked around the world on nationally and internationally fed, uh, federally classified historical sites, including two UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And of course, he has a lot of stories from the time that, from the times that he spent, the time he spent becoming a compagnon. And so he's, he's quite well-traveled, he's quite knowledgeable. And um, without further ado, I am going to turn the floor over to you, Patrick. Okay. And thank you very, very much for, um, for participating. I will point out one other thing that there is a, um, you can go to our website and donate money to um, Patrick and just let us know that that's what you wanted. Or you can go to uh, Patrick's um, uh, website. And it's, uh, it, it was in the weekly guild notes, so you can go there. And uh, you can just donate some money uh, to uh, Patrick's school and, and his efforts. And I would encourage you to do that because I think this is well worth a contribution. So I'm sorry, Patrick. That's good. Thank you very much. I appreciate the intro. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, I'm going to try to skip um, some of the, the beginning lessons that we learned last time. And so I'm not going to introduce the new concepts of things like neutral plane. Uh, plan view, elevation view, skip views, and stuff like that. So um, it'll just speed along the process to get to the information that most people, you know, if you listen to the first one, uh, you know, what they're after. So I'm just going to turn the uh, I'm just going to turn the camera around and we're going to look at uh, my screen, um, and I'll introduce uh, you know the the very basics of a hip and uh, you know backing angles and kind of you know what's a hip basically. So. All right, so I think everyone should be seeing this. Um, basically, uh, this is, these are some of the uh, notes that is used uh, in stage one of the online courses. So students, they get this information on a USB stick and it basically, you just read it through. So this, this first page is just what's the definition of a hip as opposed to a valley or something like that. So basically a hip is an intersection of uh, two uh, roof planes. I mean, again, just take this up with a grain of salt. These are the basic premises of what a hip is. And so where those two roof planes intersect, well, that precisely, that intersection is where the location of your hip would be. Um, and uh, essentially a hip is formed when uh, your two uh, top plates on plan view are greater than 180 degrees. Yeah. Um, Whereas the reverse of that, you would create a valley. So uh, and it's a, it goes on to say that on the top of your hip, we have these angles that are called backing angles. And so just to give you a little bit of context. All right, so if I, I, got, I got my little model here to show everybody. If, um, so there's, there's uh, a theoretical top plate here and a theoretical top plate there. They arrive at approximately 90. There's my hip. And so the backing angles, just for everyone to be on the same page, the backing angles are quite precisely the angle that's formed here. So there and there. So I'll just turn the, I'll turn the camera around again and then we'll continue on with that. All right, so there it is. And so below you'll see there's three examples of, of a plan view looking on a, on a hip. You have the, the two darker lines are what would resemble, or what would, you know, uh, would be your uh, top plate. So the outside of your top plates. Um, the two top examples are if the wall plates are greater or greater than 90 and then less than 90, what it can look like. 
And then the one on the bottom left um, is what happens for the most part in, in our world, uh, what happens when the wall plates are nine, just what it looks like. Um, the, the dash and continuous lines represent uh, theoretical centers. So the, the, the idea of center of the hip or, or uh, rafters. You'll notice what distinguishes these uh, rafters and hips is the rafters are always 90 degrees uh, from your top plate on plan view. So just by looking at those three examples, whatever line is 90 degree to your top plate, you know that's your rafter. Um, and then of course, and the hip goes, from, goes right into the corner of, of the top plates of the building. So I'm just gonna change the page and I'll just show you the next, uh, next bit. So this next sheet, um, it just shows uh, that there's multiple ways of creating a hip. There's not just this, the, con the standard conventional kind of what, what a lot of people would be used to of a two by material or something like that. Um, so the top left is, is, I don't know what it would, I don't know how to name these different ways of rotating a hip or positioning a hip or, or making one, but I just made, just kind of gave them names. So the top left one in a circle, you're, what you're looking at is an end view of the hip. So that's like taking a slice. Um, so there's my hip. So it's, it's like taking a slice of your hip, 90 degrees, and then looking on the end grain. Um, so the top left is what we're, most people are used to, excuse me, what we're mostly used to. We, we can clearly see those backing angles. Um, oops. The next one in the middle here is in some cases, and especially in, in old, old buildings, they would just take, instead of creating backing angles, which are the length of your hip, they would just take that whole hip material and rotate it in space. So that um, looking at on one side, you have a square cut for the, your cheek cut. And on the other side, you would have uh, essentially kind of a, a bird's mouth. And that's just a way to do it, creating a hip. The third example on the top right circle is essentially where you use two thin rafters uh, rotated um, and they have like a miter cut in between. And those get put together. And then the fourth and last example is the one below where you have uh, a built up essentially. So underneath your hip, which will, is generally small in section in, in this case, you'll have uh, maybe potentially purlins or something like this underneath. And then underneath your purlins, you would have a principal rafter supporting all that weight. And so that's what you see in that perspective view right at the very bottom of that page is a principal rafter, on top of sits a purlin, and on, on top of that purlin sits um, a smaller hip with backing angles. So um, the next sheet here is what is an what is the end view and what is an end view? And, and last time, last week we we took we took a look at this briefly. Um, and it's how does that procedure work in 3D? What, what's happening three-dimensionally in your, for you, you know, against your roof surfaces and your neutral plane, um, and how we take this view, which has been cut 90 degrees to your, um, to your hip. So then you have a slice here. And then that big triangle, so the, the triangle that runs along your roof surfaces, and then from your top plate all the way to your opposing top plate or adjacent top plate, you have a big triangle there. Well, that triangle essentially gets rotated downwards onto your neutral plane or your drawing. And what you're doing is you're exposing what's, what are the actual backing angles. Um, in 3D, of course, you can take that information, but in your drawing, because it's 2D, you can't. You get a false reading of what that actual angle is. So that's why we rotate it down so you can visually see it 90 degrees to your surface. And then that's the most ac that's accurate. <clears throat> And so essentially what we're going to do today is this little task where we're going to look at uh, the end view, uh, straying a hip. Um, and I think if I remember, yeah, there was, I think that the notion of, of uh, footprint planes and stuff like that. Okay.
So I'll, I'm going to flip the, uh, the, the, uh, the camera back to me. Um, there you go. Um, and so like we did last time, I just talked a little bit and I'll flip the camera down so we can look at the actual sheet. Um, and as, as I'm drawing, I'm going to look at that task sheet that you just seen. Okay. So I'll pull up that task sheet. Everybody else have Patrick as a small picture? He doesn't show up large on my. Oh, really? No, no, no. Is that my problem or? No idea. For everybody else? Um, that was what I, I was saying at the beginning. If you go into your upper left hand corner of the screen, you my, should have, gal left, you or, should have or, gallery view. I'm right hand, I'm sorry, right hand. You should have gallery view, and if you click on gallery view, then 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 you get the speaker view. Okay. Yeah. Thank All you. right. You're welcome. Okay. Carry on, Patrick. All right. Cool. Um, so, like last time, uh, the simple instruments are a drafting uh, triangle. So this is about a 14-inch drafting triangle, a 16-inch drafting triangle, and a just a clear plastic ruler. Um, on the on the job site, really, you just use a corner of a piece of plywood or a corner of a piece of MDF or something, and you just cut a, an angle. It doesn't like it doesn't have to be forty five degrees. The biggest, the, the most important thing is that that hypotenuse is flat or straight, perfectly straight, and that is ninety. That's that's all. So with those basic tools, we can obtain uh, basically your imagination, really. So um, so I'm going to flip the camera down. Uh, and I'll start doing the, the, the plan view and then doing elevation views and then looking at that end view process. All right. Okay, so like I said last time, uh, I'm, I'm left-handed. And so I generally, I have my ruler in my left hand. I'm right hand, or excuse me, I'm right-handed drawing. So I have my, my triangle in my right hand and, my, and in my left hand, I have my ruler. So generally I'll draft with the 90 pointing towards me and kind of in this fashion. So uh, we, we really looked at last video how we can make parallels using the sliding of a, of a ruler uh, and then how we can do 90s very quickly and then parallels with, of that. So I'll be using that same technique. So uh, the first thing in that task sheet, just draw basically a square and um, Make the square about 15 by 10. So the 15 by 10, I could probably make it a little bit bigger um, just for the sake of this, this bit. So put it right here. So there's my first top plate line. I'll make my 90 off of that. And then there's my other top plate. Sometimes I don't know for whatever reason the camera gets blurry, but hopefully it's, it, it sharpens up a little bit. There it is. So there's my top plates. So um, in that task sheet, I don't, it's not given a very specific, uh, so on that task sheet, it's not given a specific pitch of the roof. It's given just the height of a king post at a given space, pace, or distance. Uh, so that'll, you know, given your run and your rise, you can figure out your pitch. So for, for this, in this case and in this instance, um, we can just make up the pitch. So again, the, it's completely irrelevant. Uh, so regardless of the pitch, as long as you follow these principles, it'll always, it'll always work out. Okay. So like I was saying in the very beginning, um, the rafters on plan view, are always 90 to my roof surface. So I'm just gonna throw in my a rafter here on plan view. Let's say something like this, like that. And at that point, I'm gonna give myself a height. So I'm gonna create an elevation view of this rafter. And at the same time, while I'm kind of doing these things, I'm gonna create the, uh, the adjacent rafter that goes to that same point with that same height. Yeah. So there's my, so this is my rafter on plan view. 
gets that little symbol for center. There's my other raptor on plan view. And, um, and of course, I'm gonna basically focus in on that point, but I'm gonna draw in from that point a known height. And also then I can connect this point down to the corner. And that'll give me my hip on plan view. So there's my hip, uh, center of my hip. All right. So I'm gonna just draw in the, uh, the rafter elevations. So this rafter and this rafter. I'm gonna chase away the view. So the elevation view, you most, sometimes you can, depending on space, you can do the elevation view right on top of your plan view. But what ends up happening very quickly is you get a lot of lines. So by chasing away your, your elevation view, um, it just keeps the drawing a little clearer. So I bring up uh, my known point here. So that point gets thrown up onto the elevation view, the extension of my top plate down uh, until it meets my neutral line, my neutral plane. So I'm just gonna give myself, well, what's the height at that point? Well, that, the height of that point is gonna be represented along this line. So, I don't know, we can say anything. We can say, let's go, uh, yeah. We'll just say it's gonna be this high, boom, 10. Right. There, so that's, that's the height at that point. And then I'm gonna connect the height down to the corner where the top plate and the neutral plane meet. There it is. So there's my first rafter elevation, uh, this rafter here on plan view. So we, we, let's go ahead and just label these, I guess. So let's, let's call this top plate, excuse me, A, or roof plane A, and we'll call this one B roof plan uh, B. So this is my elevation of roof plan A. Oh, that's gonna be upside down, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna do the elevation for the neck for of uh, after uh, B, roof plan B. Again, same thing, I'm gonna chase away that view. And then a 90 from my neutral plane through my known height. I'm going to just extend that. There it is. And so uh, this is where it's nice to have um, just a story pull. So I'm going to transfer the height at that point from the first elevation I drew to the second elevation. Instead of um, always trying to measure things to try to get down to you know, the 64th of an inch, a really fast and easy, easy way is just to use a drywaller's tape or just a, a story pole. So I got some here. So it's just a, yeah, it's exactly what you'd think, drywaller's tape. So you just take a length of it. that. And again, I'll flip the camera down and we'll continue uh, with the drawing part. There. So um, I know there's my known height. So I'm just going to take that with my story pole from my neutral line, the very peak, and then transfer that to this elevation view. And so there's my point. So I can go ahead and connect there down to the bottom and that will give me my raptor. So again, you got, uh, this is roof plane B elevation. Elevation. Roof plane B. And so again, as I, as I said last week, um, the, the advantage of doing this is that you can obtain um, your seat cut or your level cut here. 
So by simply just taking the angle between your neutral line, so this one, and your rafter with your T-bevel, so there's your level cut. 90 degrees to that, of course, is then your plumb cut. So you have your level of plumb for your uh, rafters on B roof, and same thing on A, so you have your uh, level and plumb cut for rafters uh, A. So that's it. Um, now that I have my rafter elevations, I'm going to go ahead and do my hip elevation. So same thing, it's going to be a triangle. I'm going to take a parallel from it, chase it away over to about here, um, and then develop that. So when you make an elevation view, you always want to take a parallel from that piece on plan view. And then that gives you your neutral line. So there's my neutral line. And then 90 degrees from that, I can then throw up my known point. Looking on plan view, so through that point there. And then through this point in the very corner. And then put that up onto its elevation, so a little point. So I'm just going to go ahead and extend this line a little bit. Like so. Um, and then that's where I'm going to take my story pole. So where I took the height originally at that point, I transfer it here. Well, I'm also going to transfer it here because all three pieces, so your two rafters and your hip, they must all join at the same known height. And then I'm going to go ahead and connect from my known height down to the corner, and that gives me my hip elevation. Oh, there it is. So similarly, uh, looking at your hip elevation, you have your neutral, or excuse me, your level cut. So my neutral plane, level cut and plumb cut. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll just stop it there. So, so far so good is if anyone has any questions about the elevation views, plan view. Okay, I'll keep going and we're gonna do the, uh, the next thing is we're gonna do the end view and then straying of the hip, right? Hey Patrick. Uh, yeah. Are A and B opposite in your plan? And uh, what do you mean are the opposite? Well, you've got them marked A and B. Yeah. Are they, are they, should, they, should they be reversed or am I wrong? Uh, well, I just gave that roof surface, just those two roof surfaces, a, a label. Okay. okay, but when you show, when you marked it as, you got your A and B, your neutral lines, and then yeah. you marked. So you're talking about this here? Like you got plan, plan view B and then you got plan view A. Well, they're all plan view A plan view. Be plan view B. Well, they're all in the same plan view. So this square is plan view. Yep. It encompasses A and B. Okay. Now is B. Now the one you got plan A is that A or B? Uh, roof plane A. Okay. Okay. So that's roof plane A elevation. Wh which so is which? Which is on your square? Which is is A or B? A. It says there that's plane A. Oh, okay. Right there. Okay. I thought, I thought maybe it just folded down. Like I'm looking at. I thought A was B. No, B's over here. So okay. that's roof plane B. So you have a pitch here. Yep. And then those rafters, so like I have my little, as if my marker is my rafter, there it is like standing up. I take oh. it and rotate it. Oh, oh, okay, I see, okay, I see. I've got, yep. but you've got to mark plan B there. Uh, roof plane B. Roof plane, okay. Yeah, oh, plane. Oh. Okay. So there, yeah, an E at the end of that. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yep, all good. Okay, so um, once uh, once we have your the hip elevation drawn in, I'm going to go ahead and do that backing angle thing. So the backing angle. Let me just fire up that um, that previous um, picture. So uh, up one there. So there it is. So that's the end view. So the MVU basically, as it says, is a procedure that permits to determine the backing angles. Uh, bird's mouths, and if you have nosings, des in French, uh, pearlings and jackrafters. 
So that's what's happening. Um, that perspective is what's going to be happening two-dimensionally. So when I look at the task sheet, it, that same triangle is found right here. Okay. All right. So um, the first step is to take a 90 degree off of your hip anywhere along, it's arbitrary, but anywhere along the length of that hip. Okay. So 90 degrees from my hip. here just like that so that's the first step so 90 degrees off of your hip um, so basically what's happened here it looks it's obviously two-dimensionally but you have a slice through your hip and so let me throw that that uh, sheet back up and I'll see if I can make this clearer so that one slice of that one line that I drawn in encompasses really, it's the combination of this line here, which follows your roof surface, the one inside, so that 90 degree, which, which is clear, which is what I've drawn. And then the other one that goes along the other surface. So that line there. So when you rotate your vision 90 degrees to, to that hip elevation, all you see is a line, right? So there it is. So within that line, you have a triangle that basically goes from the roof peak down to your, your, um, your neutral plane. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, rotate it down, so then that triangle then becomes visible so we can see it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that whole length with the story pole, so from the neutral line to the hip, take that length. And uh, rotate it down onto your neutral line. So, I mean, another way you can do, so I did with a story pole, of course, the other thing you could do is to use your compass. It might be a little bit more visual this way, but it's, a, it's the same principle. So I take that distance. Of course, the pivot being this point along the neutral line, and I just rotate, rotate that down like so. So essentially, that distance is identical to that distance. The point that I just rotated down, so this point here, I'm gonna bring this point onto plan view, just on, onto the hip on plan view. So right here, about. Whereas this point along the neutral line, I'm going to make a big old line across the whole plan view. So it's across my two top plates. So the first one, just a little point along your, your, on your hip on plan view, just like that. So you can barely see it, but there it is. And then the next, the next point there on the elevation, big line through your whole drawing your plan view, just like that. And so the points that interest me the most is where that line crosses your top plates, so here and here. I'm gonna reconnect those points with the one that I rotated down here. So there, down to there. So once I reconnect those, then that triangle becomes apparent, then you can see it. Like that. there. And so let me just zoom in a little bit if I can. So there. And so what's so interesting about doing this is that this is the end view. So this whole triangle is the end view. And so what that means is that this angle in here, let me just mark that in color. Patrick, yeah. uh, I think that your line missed. I think you were supposed to try and hit the plate and you intersected an extension of the plate. Yeah, so, and, 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 that's, and that's a really good uh, point that you pointed out, but see, uh, but the principle is that it goes through your top plates. 
So even though this line goes beyond your raster on plan view, it still remains your, your top plate. So let me take a step back. Let's say I do, when I did my first 90 here, this point, this 90 is arbitrary along the length of my hip. The further I bring this line up, this way, let's say, the further this line is going to move as well in consequence to that. It has to, right? Because then I always bring that same point. So the further I bring this line up, the further this line moves in this direction, furthering this point along this line. So in other words, what I guess I'm trying to say is that it doesn't matter. This, this fell through off of your, what you would think is your plan view, but it, it's, it's irrelevant. So even, even this point can be way over here or way off your page, but you, you still have to get to it. So um, the angles that are so interesting to us right now is this angle in here. That one. And this one. So those two angles, I would just take with the T-bevel. So I take the T-bevel along this line, which that line, believe it or not, is the roof surface along roof surface A. And then I'll, and I'll show you later, but just bear with me for a moment. And this line runs, the roof, runs along the roof surface of roofs of B. Oops, can't see that, sorry. But there is B. So it runs, along, it runs along that roof surface. So let me now take a step back and show you that, uh, show you that perspective. So there it is. So you can see how uh, where my cursor is is at the top plate. That point um, connects to this point along the roof surface. Once that point here has been folded down, and you can see it gets folded down there, then that point reconnects to here. Thus, this line and that line are the same. They're the same lines. Same thing on the other side. So you have your backing angle essentially running the roof surface, running along the roof surface to the top plate. Once that point has been rotated down onto your neutral plane, so your plan view where you can see it, you reconnect that point with the one down to your top plate. And so this line is this line. They're the same lines. So that's I mean, that's, pr that's how you do a backing angle. That's, that's it. Um, the principle is that you, you do your 90 off of your hip, you rotate that down. The, the point that's on the roof gets to the center of your hip on plan view. The other point gets this long line across uh, your top plates. So, yeah. And so let me pull up a model now of your backing angles. So and I'm just going to, again, rotate this camera down. But there's my, there's my model. I mean, it's not, it's not going to represent exactly. I didn't draw this exactly to this, but the principle's there. So you can imagine that this is my, this, this surface here where, where the roofs, uh, excuse me, pull it there, there, it's a little better. So this surface here, so on this line, this surface here is surface A. And then this surface here is surface B. So this angle, the one in blue here, would be, let me just zoom in on that if I can. So this angle here, that back angle, would be the one that you put on this side. And then this one in pink would be the one you put onto this side. Hey, Patrick. 
Yes. Yeah, I, I, you might want to note that the, 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 the angles, I mean, those are the angles from the, from the aris of the hip below level. I mean, they, they're, they're not the saw angle you'd use for ripping that off the face of the hip. So that's, that's, those angles there are from, are from, are the angle on the top of the hip, but it'd be different if you were trying to figure out you, for which angle to use to, for, to set a saw to, to rip that. Well, you would, that's, that's your angle for the saw, depending on what face you're, of the surface you're cutting on, of course, but. Would it be the complement to that though? I mean, I, I guess it's, 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 it's I mean, for drawing off, off the. Uh, no, so that's, no? that's your saw angle as well. So let me just grab a piece of wood and I'll, and I'll show you what I, what I mean, okay? So let's just say this is my rough stock of my material, okay? Um, I'm going to transfer those angles that I found on the drawing and transfer it onto here, and then we'll see if it's if it's a little clearer. Okay? So let me just grab my T bevel. All right. So, got my T bevel. Um, I'm gonna rotate that camera down. Zoom in. Okay. So, uh, let's go with the the pink. So the B. So I just grab that angle. So a good way of doing that is you can. I'm just gonna put a piece on that line on my hip on plan view. Let's see if I can do this without, and then grab, and then put the bevel along that um, roof surface or on the back angle. Just like that. So there's, there's my angle. Okay, that makes sense for, for everybody. Now when I have my piece, let me, oops. Just got a sliver. Yeah. So when I got my piece here, I'm going to take that angle, transfer it uh, like this. Give me a moment. Yeah. No, I had it. Sorry. That. Okay. And then the next angle, so I'll grab the blue and I'll transfer it here. Does it, is that, are those lines supposed to be centered on that timber or does it not well, matter for the sex yeah, that's, that's a good question. We haven't gotten there yet. So, so far, all we've obtained are backing angles. Where exactly do you locate those backing angles? We don't know yet. So it's, it's like last week's episode where it, it shifts based on the relative angles. Exactly, yep. So then we still have to stray the hip to locate, well, where does, where does that, where does that exact intersection occur? Yeah. Let's say uh, for most uh, uh, regular hips, so root pitches are the same, well, that point would be right in the center of your, of your hip material. Whereas the moment you get into like a bastard hip or an irregular hip, uh, it could shift because if you stray your hip. If you don't stray the hip, then it's always going to be the center of the material. Does that make sense? It should shift if you want equal uh, fascia on and over equal fascia on your uh, on your overhangs. Exactly. Yeah. You. That's that's one thing. Yep. Yep. So you can. I mean, most conventional framers won't shift. Won't stray the hip. They'll have maybe a back heel on one side, or just just nail the shit out of the sheathing. You know. I don't know. <laughs> so um, let me just rotate that the camera down. And I'll get the next back angle and I'll, I'll apply it to my p the to the timber, and then maybe it'll be a little bit more uh, visual. So then the next back angle is is the blue one. Are you going to work through straying the hip tonight? Yep. So 
there it is. So we can all agree there's my angle. And then I'll apply that. Oops, just give me one moment. And I'll apply that to So there's my, there's my roof plan A in blue and my roof plan B uh, in pink. So when I, when I put that back on the plan, so, you can, so that you can see the side with my, with my index is A, blue. Once I rotate that, then it's, then it's on the right side. So essentially I, I made that section cut like here, made that section cut on the elevation and, and then rotate it. So this piece essentially standing perfectly on end like that. So that's, that's the idea of that, of the, of the, of the backing angles. Um, yeah. Then, then the next thing, um, of course, is, is to straight. Not that you have to, not that you have to find your backing angles and then straight. It's, it's either or, it's either procedure. You can straight and then do your backing angles. So it's whatever or. And hey, so, sorry, did someone have a question there? Yeah, Al Anderson. So you're looking at uh, top down, not bottom up of the hip for the yeah, backing angle. Okay, then that's a, that's a wonderful uh, observation because let me show you on the drawing why, why that is and not the other way. So. So, so see how I took, um, I took this view. So there's my 90 on my hip and I'm looking at it essentially like that uh, from the top down this way. So I took that, this is my ref. So there's, this is my perspective of view this way because I took that surface, rotated in this manner. Let's say if I took this and cause I'm crazy or whatever and rotate it the other way, well, then my perspective then changes so that I'm looking from the bottom up. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. So it depends on, on, on your drawing, uh, just how, cl how clear and neat you want it to be. You can rotate that either way. It's the same principle and it'll always work. But you just got to keep that in mind, you know. Yeah, just be caught, you know, mindful of what side you're rotating it. Same angles, right? It's the same angle. So yeah, it, it always is. It's regardless. Yeah. So again, like regardless of the root pictures and anything, these ball plates can be any angle. This principle will always work. Always. That's the beauty. So, um, so let me continue with the drawing. I'm going to stray the hip now. So I'm going to offset this hip based on, uh, on the roof pitches, essentially. Before I do that, does anyone have any other questions? Uh, I, I, I'd note that I, I wrote this in the, in the chat here that, that Patrick wrote an article that was appeared in uh, Timber Framing number 106, which is the December 2012 issue on pages 18 to 24 that cover this, um, this procedure, but, all, but all specifically with, uh, with, uh, with uh, a regular, pla uh, regular uh, uh, plate, plate angle, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a non-90 degree plate angle, um, so a, a regular plan. Um, proof uh, in that all the all the issues of the journal from 100 to the present number 120 and 135 are all available on the guild on the member section of the guild website. So you could, uh, if, you, if you go there and look for issue 106, you can uh, a very clear step-by-step uh, -step explication of, of what Patrick's doing. If you want to follow along that way too. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for bringing that up. Thanks, yeah, that's really good. Um, so anybody else? So I'll do the I'll do the string of the hip then. So I'm gonna again rotate that um, the camera down and I'll show you. And I got a model and I'll show you as well. So so there's a, a, here's a hip model that you know that one of the students did. But essentially, uh, what string does, looking on plan view, um, is that it brings. Let me just grab something pointy to point at. Point with I mean. Um, so the, my hip, it might not look too, it might look similar on the camera, but you could see how the, this center of this backing angle is a little bit closer 
to this side um, than this side. So it's been shifted over uh, this way to me. But what, what actually what's happening is this point here on plan view is square across to that point. So that is square across with one another. And the result of that is that it gives you the same distance from the backing angle. So this line here, and that line to the bottom of your hip. So that surface, not, not necessarily the whole surface area, but this distance, that parallel would be the same as this one. So the distance between my backing angle and the bottom of my face here. So that distance is the same as this distance. And so like one of the other persons mentioned is it's, it's really good or it's, it's important uh, to do if you have a similar size fascia and your hip it has an overhang or you know like a, yeah. So um, the first step in doing your string, um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit uh, in on this corner here of, uh, of um, my plan view, right there. And so the first step in straying the hip is you want to take a 90 off of that corner, so from uh, 90 from the hip on plan view. Just like that, Does it, the length of that line is, is irrelevant. But um, this is where you'd have to know well, what's the size of my material? What's the actual thickness of my hip material? So, who knows, we could say two inches, 10 inches, whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's just say it's going to be uh, three centimeters. So knowing that your hip width is three centimeters, you're gonna put three centimeters on either side of this line. So from this point three, that point three, so your overall total is six. Three, two, three there and there. And then this is where um, we're going to locate, um, essentially the next step is to locate, well, where are these, these two points? To then, to then locate the hip on plan view. So um, I'm going to focus on this, on this point for now. Um, we're going to take a parallel from top plate B. So basically the adjacent top plate, run it through that point until it meets top plate A. And then we'll do the same thing with this one. Run a parallel from top plate A through that point until it reaches top plate B. So some people say go square back from A through that point, but that's incorrect. Um, that only works if your top plates are square. The moment your top plates are out of square, like if you're doing an octagon, um, you, it, it, the principle is parallel from B through that point and then parallel from A through this point. So what I've just obtained now are these two points of interest, which are uh, these two points there and there. So now what I can do is run parallels from the that's the theoretical center of my hip on plan view through those two points. And then that will give me the uh, strayed hip. So there it is. So then there is the actual uh, hip material. So you can always just double check if you want, but that is three centimeters or be close because um, I'm drawing with a fat pen, a marker and not being super accurate. But um, so you can see that it's actually a little shorter here and a little longer here. Um, and so then now you can see essentially this backing angle, you can see it a little bit more, it becomes a little bit more clearer. Um, and then so now looking at this end view, I, we can look, we can focus in on a little bit more. There's the width of my material. What's the depth of my material? I don't know. Um, Let's say my hip is, uh, uh, let's say four centimeters. Doesn't matter whether we get to two by 10 or whatever. I can measure down four from the peak and I'm gonna make a 90 across here. And then you'll very clearly see the end view of that hip. So 
so you can see that surface area, that's the actual end view of the hip. So I wanted to, I can draw in some nice growth rings, some drawing cracks, you know, get all fancy. You mean get French? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, they draw in the lengths of the fibers too. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> um, so that's uh, so that's pretty much the uh, the straying process. So we covered um, the uh, the back angles, the end view, and then the straying. And so let me just just finalize. I think it's getting close to that time. So I'm just going to finalize and then just just to you know explain one last bit. So looking at then my end view what I can do, so here's my actual material, to go back to my material. I could take this distance from this line to that line, apply it to here, and I get my, the center. So that point is this line. And then from that point, I apply those two angles to, uh, according to this, to the faces that are vertical, my plumb faces. So then I can do my B. So let's say this one just for ease of clarity. So that'd be here. And then my A angle would be here. And then looking at my end view, so let me do this. Uh, the, 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 once I've straight it, well then this point is square across to that point. If I had a square. And so that gives you that, this same distance, the distance from here to here is the same as the one from here there. So, uh, any questions? I think that was it. Patrick? Yes, sir. Is this a similar process for what you did on your curved hip in the model behind you? Yes, that, the curved hips, um, it gets, <laughs> you basically stray it at every single point along your plan view, and that gives you that shifting of your, your hip. Thank you so much. This has been a complicated thing to wrap my head around in life. So was it, that? I didn't catch that. The backing angles on hand cut roof framing has always been mental gymnastics for me and you've put it in a way that is making it so much more achievable. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I, I said this last time and I'll say it again, we've been uh, dominated by what, kind of in the trades in carpentry, we've been dominated by, uh, uh, you know, a certain way of thinking. Um, and, and that's generally using numbers and math and using, uh, you know, SOCAT TOA algebra, and so, um, we kind of just forgot that there's another way of obtaining it. And I, and in my opinion, I think it's, it's far better and it's far more empowering and the things you can do with it is far greater. Um, and it lends you into a road that's quite, uh, uh, endless. It's, it's really what your imagination uh, is capable. As long as you have a straight edge, a drafting triangle, uh, you can, you can, you can draw it and you can build it. I love it. Who needs numbers? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, take it with a grain of salt, but that's, that's, yeah. I do want to comment on that, that curved hip, you know, I think that, you know, with a little bit of clarity, you know, that's an ever changing backing cut, right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, pull it up. So that's that, that's this uh, hip. Um, so that the, it's hard to kind of get an exact, way of portraying it, but you might get the idea here where um, the center of your hip relation to your face is always changing as you go up. And you can see it's closer here than it is there. And then as you come down on the, it, it kind of will sway over to the opposing side. So it's closer, right at the very bottom there, excuse me. It's closer to this side as it is to, uh, instead of this side. And again, that's just giving you that consistent um, depth along the whole length of the hip here uh, and on that side as well. So the depth uh, there. 
And so the underside of the hip, it too has a kind of a, a squirrely, uh, let's see if I can capture that there. You, it too has this kind of compound curve packed underneath. So Patrick, did you cut that with a, with a coping saw or how did you cut yeah. that? With my hands, <laughs> uh, a rasp essentially. Yeah, uh, so when it comes to the actual curve, so, so this here, um, bunch of handsaw, basically, uh, it's, uh, we use a large, in this case, we, I use a large block. Out of that block, I cut out this curve. Um, so a bunch of curve cuts, ch you know, chisel it out and then, and then rasp it, basically. And then, you know, near the end uh, with a scraper, you scrape it away. Very, it, it's very time consuming. Um, but if you, you know, you got to practice, you know. Um, and same with the backing angles. So the backing angles, once you have your two face cuts, your two vertical faces cut out of your block, you can then plot out, well, where does that curve of this backing angle uh, plot out on, on the face of your material? So then you just cut according, you know, you just cut to your line and then, and then you know, it should be good or very close anyways. Hey, uh, Patrick. Yes, sir. Where can I get one of them sweet compasses? One of, the, one of these guys? Yeah, man, I think it's dope. Yeah, uh, Lee Valley, man. Really? Yeah, yeah, Lee, I think, yeah, Lee Valley has these things. It's just a, just a regular kind of compass, um, yeah. All right, and then uh, when, you're, when you're doing these drawings for an actual project, how, are they the same size as what you're doing now, or do you? Yeah, so that, great question, and, and it's, I, I love hearing it. So the, the, it's, it, it's, there's no one direct answer. Uh, it, it's both. Uh, you, I can, you can certainly, if you're doing, let's say all you have to obtain are your backing angles and the hip shift, you can do it this size. That's, that's no problem. Uh, the angles don't change. Um, the length of, or the width of that material will change depending on the scale that you use. But, um, um, but if I'm going to do, let's say, a full layout and I have multiple pieces that need, uh, require full layout, then, then you, would, you would try to do it as best you can to lay it on, on your shop floor or the, you know, the subfloor of the, of, the, of the house. But for the most part, and, and again, um, there's different techniques of drafting or drawing. So what I've drawn is a very, very basic uh, method, but there's uh, a romber ma method. Uh, bevel method and combinations and alignment alignement and all these other methods so depending on what you're looking for uh it'll dictate what technique of drafting you use and and, and what what are your tools at hand essentially is what it comes down to and and then the west the best way i can always describe that is like having a tool in your toolbox it's it's uh, not one way is better than the other or, 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 or one's faster. It depends on the situation, depend what you have, what's your conditions, the site conditions, all those things that dictate, okay, well, I'm going to use the bevel method, a combination of the bevel method and Ron Burma, or just full layup and scribe it. You know what? It has. One thing and, I would like to mention, um, you talked earlier about separating your uh, elevations from your plan view. Um, I know once you get more familiar with drafting in this technique and the basic layout, you can achieve better accuracy by folding everything down straight from the plan view. Um, do you have any drawings like that? Um, uh, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I certainly do, but not... Um, not readily accessible? Well, I mean, it'd be on my computer and I'd have to like filter through the thousands of photos, but um, yeah. And, and the, th the thing is that the photos, when you take a picture of your, of your drawing, it doesn't look like anything. It just looks like a bunch of lines. So it's hard to give context to it. Yeah. Um, that's, so that's why chasing, in the beginning of, while you're learning it for the first time, you know, you're chasing away your views, keeps things very nice and clear and open. Okay, there's, Clearly, my hip elevation, my plan view, my uh, rafter elevation. But like you said, you know, the, technically, the closer you can keep these views together, superimpose them one on top of the other, uh, the more accurate you can maintain. Uh, but the I get it. sorry, go ahead. I was getting at is like if you were to cut this in your shop, you know, you try to keep everything tight, neat and tidy. Right. Whereas what you're showing right now, 
is really good for learning how to do it and to keep things clear right. and all the above but accuracy is the key and the 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 less you drag those lines around you know the more tidy you're going to be yeah for sure and i yeah definitely but i i would i would suggest if you're learning for the first time always chase your views away we always like in the online courses we always chase views away up until uh there's an exam in stage two where students, uh, it's a real life size model. So life size meaning maybe four by six, four feet by six feet, but maybe another four feet high. Um, and they have no option because it's so big that they superimpose drawings, applying all the previous uh, you know, tasks, you know, the information that they've done previously on this one drawing and, and it creates new skills, you know? So you have to really uh, be cautious of what lines am I going to? That's why we label lines, uh, we color lines, uh, so it's trying to be as clear as possible. So, yeah. Patrick, um, does that circle in the center of your triangle have a purpose? Yeah. So this thing, um, it's to grab, essentially, just while it's on the uh, while it's on the uh, sheet on the on the uh, drawing. I could just grab that and move it and slide it. So I don't have to grab. Like if you imagine that hole wasn't there, I'd have to, you know, spread my hands quite far to to, to grab that. So it's like a, a thumb hole or something like that, I guess that you would, you could see like uh, this picture behind me. So that picture there, you could see there's some old, uh, you know, that picture was taken in 18, 9, 1893. And you can see that they have triangles with little thumb holes in it. And that's just for that. Move it around as you draw. So can you show up that Vizigoo? Uh, it's, I could just, uh, uh, sure, I can show it. Yeah, if you want. The, the big triangle, big triangles without, without holes in them will also like, will have like suction to the paper and be really hard to move. So that the holes in the middle help, you know, break, break that so they're easy to move around and don't get stuck in place. It's just uh, filled with oil. So I'm hesitant of kind of grabbing it like I would usually, but there it is. Please, thank you. Uh, made by, um, you know, the uh, Peugeot, Peugeot Frères, so it's a French company back in the day. So this is uh, stamped 1917, so just, uh, you know, during the First World War. Yeah, kind of a cool, cool tool. Yeah. Um, any, anything else, any other questions people might have? I'm kind of curious about that length of fiber business on the drawing. That that sounds like not no way. Uh, sorry, length of fiber? You'd say the French draw like a, the length of the fibers on their drawing. I'm like, no oh, one does yeah. that. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, you know, uh, go well. I mean, go look at uh, the old drawings, like in uh, the book uh, by Louis Masrol. Um, I mean, not only did it just like you know those old drawings, they're uh, they're. Uh, the old printers, they would actually have to engrave it into a piece of, well, usually it's a, depending on how many prints you make, but a, a metal uh, plaque. And they would draw on every single wood fiber. And if there's a knot, they draw that out. And so then when they make their prints of the, of the drawings, you see the fibers. <laughs> carve it out of the plate, right? Yeah, they carve it out. Yeah, exactly. So, and then depending on the quality as well, uh, when it comes to finer details, I think they would use like a metal, uh, printing press as opposed to wood. Does that mean in these drawings you would know the species of the wood? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, good point. I don't know, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know if we get that, that detailed. That, that will never happen in this country. Uh, you might, yeah, I, you know yeah. that I, I was looking at the French Amazon and they said the September this year, they're supposed to release a new edition of Maserol's oh, uh, cool. book. Yeah. Well, if it's the French, they're going to choose French oak, right? Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, they just, yeah, oak's the predominant, depending depending where you are in France, but oak's generally the predominant wood. French oak. Yeah. They laughed at me once and I said, uh, yeah, there's red oak too <laughs> in the world. And they all just kind of laughed because they all yeah, they just have white oak. No, just French oak, right? 
Yeah, it's well, separate. I think it's it's technically like a type of white oak. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not the same Latin name. It's a little bit different, but it's pretty much the same. As yeah. Don't don't tell any don't tell any French carpers that's the same species as English oak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, Patrick, on behalf of, um, I'm sure, everybody here and um, on behalf of the, the, the uh, board of directors, uh, we, we really thank you for these two sessions. They, they were wonderful. They were really, really good. Very educational and a whole lot of fun to watch. So thank you very much. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Thank you. Patrick, could you uh, uh, rename that book you suggested? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, by Louis Maserol. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that, that's like the, the author, Louis Maserol. It's a French book. Uh, it's like Traité de Charpente, uh, Théorie et Pratique, if that means anything. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank cool. you, Patrick. Yeah, it's, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for people coming up. Thank